so as we mentioned, um, I now run an organization called the Collective Intelligence Project. Uh, I used to be a political economist and social technologist at Microsoft. And a lot of my focus recently has been on this question of what it really means to democratize AI. This is something that we hear a lot about, both in the critical technology space and in the tech industry. And I think it means very different things to very different people. In the US, you also hear a lot about it on the policy side, um, which is also true in certain spaces in India. And so currently my focus has been around not only defining what it could mean to democratize AI, which to me is a crucial part of any responsible AI research agenda, but also trying to put forward different kinds of proposals for each different kind of democratization. So first, given that we haven't defined responsible AI yet, uh, and I don't want to take the burden, I will just say I know that this is a subset of a lot of different kinds of work that are really necessary for the responsible AI space. And so under responsible AI, we might want to be thinking about risks and harms. We might want to be thinking about structural changes, bias, discrimination, um, internal governance, deployment decisions. All of those can fit under the umbrella of responsible AI. To me, my focus is on this question of democratization, um, which is just one piece of that. Uh, and by way of introduction, one other major focus for me is around collective intelligence capabilities. So what does that mean? We have a lot of default ways that collectives end up making decisions over what's important. Um, we use democratic votes. We use things like market-based mechanisms, companies have ways of making decisions. And all of that kind of adds up into how we as a society decide what is good and what is not good and how we end up you know, with the technologies that we end up with. And for me, we can you know, work on the different endpoints of that. We can work within companies as I did for a while to try to advance a more responsible agenda. We can do our own individual research to try to advance the goals of AI safety, but we can also work on this decision-making process as a whole to try to figure out, okay, how do we end up to these endpoints? Are there different incentive structures to set up? So one thing that I have worked on, for example, internally at Microsoft were different incentive structures around internal data sharing, to try to change how we end up making decisions around what kind of AI gets built. And so that's kind of the level at which I typically end up intervening, but obviously there are many other levels at which you could intervene. And then, um, wow, time is going very quickly. So my last kind of framework E point here is around this question of democratization of AI. So I think it's really important to know when you talk about democratization of AI, which is often discussed as sort of a, a good thing that we might want to do with artificial intelligence. There are four different types of democratization I think we should be thinking about. And particularly in a context like India, each one of them takes a really different kind of intervention, a really different kind of research, and will end up in a pretty different kind of world. And ideally, we need some balance and some investment in all of these different kinds of things, right? So the first that I think most commonly discussed is around democratization of use. And this means, can we have more people able to access technologies that they might find useful? And I think working on democratization of use looks like addressing the AI divide. And so we already have a really significant digital divide. I think we've all heard about it a lot. And we are soon to have something much closer to an AI divide um, where frontier technologies are much more accessible to the elite. They're much more accessible to the West. What does it look like to try to expand education to understand what people want from these technologies, but also just to make sure that they are able to use them to the best of their ability over time. And I think often when you hear industry players, for example, discussing something like democratization of AI, they often mean democratization of use, right? And cynically, they may also mean democratization of purchase power, basically. We want more people to be able to buy this technology. And so while I do think there is a lot of important work to be done in the responsible AI space on use, um, I would caution that we not keep our, our understanding of democratization purely to the use side. And so the next form of democratization, which I think is talked about a lot in the critical technology space, is around democratization of development. And so this is you know, co-design and participatory design of AI systems. Who is actually at the table when frontier technology gets built? I think this also includes, you know, what does the training data look like, which is a question I've worked on for a while, for what frontier technology gets trained on. And so 
is the training data multilingual? Otherwise, there's obviously really significant issues um, in terms of the outputs for different languages, which can lead to not only an inability to do democratization of use, but a lot of kind of language justice issues going forward. This also requires actually collecting the data for different languages. So, you know, speech data in India, for example, for, for English, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of well-labeled data. For Hindi, there's maybe thousands of hours of well-labeled data. For Tamar, which is my native language, there's tens of hours in some cases of really well-labeled data, right? And so a lot of this also looks like investing and trying to understand how to collect that data for different languages. There's an incredible co-op um, called Kadia that came out of Microsoft Research India that tries to work on this. I'm sure folks here um, have worked on parts of this before. And so, you know, development is, I think, a second really crucial way that people can participate in and, and be involved in the democratization of AI. The third is around benefits, and I think this is one that's maybe slightly less discussed, which is, you know, if we're going to make, if companies are going to make massive amounts of profit off of this technology, how do you ensure that some of that benefit is democratized, that there is broad and intentional kind of distribution of gains from AI? This is particularly difficult when a lot of those companies maybe are extracting data from India, say, and are bringing those profits into other countries, right? And I think some of those domestication or, or domestic um, storage conversations get to this point of how do we ensure that if there is a lot of benefit to be gained here, that benefit is accruing to people. Some of my previous work in data cooperatives tries to get at this question, some work around publicly owned models, which has been discussed in India recently, tried to get at this question of how do we ensure that benefits actually accrue to people? And given that I'm coming up on time, I'll go quickly. Um, the final one is around democratization of governance, which is actually the question that I work on the most because this is the closest to that thing we were just talking about around collective intelligence capabilities. And so democratization of governance looks like, how do you actually make decisions over AI? There are certain models that people don't want to be deployed. Do they have any decision-making power at all over whether those models do or do not get deployed? Maybe that's a community that doesn't want self-driving cars in their neighborhood, right? Maybe that's a community of Uber drivers that doesn't want AI to be trained on their data. Do they have any power? And currently, the answer is often no, it is not the case that people as a whole have some voice in whether or not things get built. And so a bunch of our work has been around trying to address this question of collective decision making and public input over AI futures. And so we're working with companies like OpenAI and Anthropic, but also policymakers around the world to directly funnel kind of public input into these models, both at the development stages and at the deployment stages. And I will say, um, I guess my, my ending provocation will be something like, while we do focus a lot on democratization of use and development in these conferences, I hope we can also talk a lot about democratization of benefits and governance, um, which I think will be very important as the AI space becomes bigger uh, and more powerful going forward. Awesome. Thank you so much and right on time. Uh, yeah, this was very, very, Interesting, and uh, there also like the point around multilinguality will be addressed soon in Shachi's talk uh, as well, so you'll hear a bit more. Uh, I'll open it up to the audience if there's any specific questions. I have a million ones, so I'll let the audience go first. Feel free to use the raise hand feature or just uh, unmute yourself. <clears throat> I mean, I, I just wanted to check, like, in, in, I mean, I understand you've sort of classified the idea of how people can participate, whether it's in like how the benefits extend, how the use cases can be deployed across the scale. But uh, do you, in your, either your research or your application towards democratization of AI, see any kind of hierarchy? in terms of the categories that you've created? Like if you say, for instance, to me, like intuitively, it feels that if you can improve participation in the governance of AI, that might have trickle effects of also improving, say, as you said, benefits of it. It's like governance is not limited to just saying yes or no to an application of AI. Governance would cover a more holistic array of issues, which could, then impact better distribution of benefits, better distribution of participation through the development of the process or development of the technology. So I wanted to understand if, if there is any hierarchy to the classification you, you've flagged. Yes, um, I, 
just put our organizational white paper in the chat, which discusses uh, our focus, which is definitely around governance. And I guess I will say two things. So one, I do think that governance can have an impact on every other layer. And that's why it's generally our area of focus on everything from, you know, the political economy of what the AI system looks like to the training data, to these questions of multilinguality, to specific applications, to the structure of the companies that build AI, all of those kinds of things can fall under governance, right? And in that sense, and, and to risk mitigation from misinformation to bias, like those are all governance questions. However, I think there are two reasons why it is not kind of the case, not that you're necessarily suggesting this, that working on governance can solve every other problem. One, I'm sure you've worked on governance for a long time, uh, and I'm curious for your experience from mine. It is very difficult to change, uh, you know, things through governance exclusively, and it also can move quite slowly. And governance decisions that may address things like multilinguality look different than governance decisions that may address like the political economy of distribution of AI benefits. And so while I do think that you can strike at the root of certain problems by aiming for governance, it is really crucial to also work on the other pieces. One, because they can address kind of that particular issue at a level that is more scoped and faster than the way that it would look like if you wanted to address that issue through governance first. Um, and then two, because there are kind of particular ways of looking at use and development in, in, in specific in terms of like ways to do participatory co-design, ways to collect different kinds of data sets, which uh, it sounds like we'll hear about soon, that are kind of technical questions at the end of the day. And while governance is its own somewhat technical discipline that has its own lens of, uh, problems, there is need to be done research side in terms of uh, Divya, I think the last part of your sentence got mangled because of a network issue. Ah, um, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I believe I was just saying that I don't believe the relationship is strictly hierarchical, although governance can kind of um, address the root cause of many issues in the other buckets. It is definitely the case that one, we don't have enough research to address, you know, what participatory design of AI systems looks like on the development side or, you know, the appropriate kind of education to enable foundation model use at different education levels. Those are not solved questions. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done in each bucket that don't just ladder up to questions of governance. Thank you. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> so your framework had four parts, use, development, benefits, and governance. Um, it's sort of related to what was already asked, but how do you sort of force people to share technology um, and share benefits when there are companies like starting to make products closed source with every passing model that comes out? Right? That's, that's a huge problem because um, OpenAI, for instance, will say that their model is the best and passes all these benchmarks but they're not willing to share source code or where the data is even trained from. And that's becoming a huge problem. Like how do um, community models even compete with those things? Like, do you have an idea for that? Yeah, so I think that is a crucial question. And generally we find it difficult to force companies to work in the good. And this has been a problem in my view in the technology for good space forever, right? However, um, there are a couple of things actually on the AI side that I think will help. So you mentioned open source versus closed source models. While it is the case that open source models are not as good on a bunch of benchmarks as closed source models currently are, they are move, like improving very rapidly. And often the only moat or reason they can improve quicker is simply capital, right? And so that's pretty lucky in a lot of ways that it's something like capital as opposed to something like pure access to data or access to algorithms or researchers. And it is the case that I think a global consortia of open source AI, for example, could start addressing those kinds of questions. Obviously, open source comes with its own risks and safety hazards. And so if it is the case that you know we want to develop further on the open source side, we will also have to accelerate a lot of the questions around like proliferation risks of dangerous models and things like that, um, which 
are, are really more necessary on the open source side than on the closed source side. Um, I think there are other ways to typically address democratization of benefits, and not all of these are purely AI questions. Uh, for example, should companies be structured differently or be required to take into account stakeholder rather than shareholder benefit? Um, should we structure taxes like automation taxes or robot taxes around AI? Should there be a social welfare fund um, to help people whose jobs have been affected by AI? Like some of these, I think, are political economic questions outside of the space of AI that are important to apply to the space of AI as we previously have to really important kind of you know, like oil, for example, not a solved problem by any means. But there are particular ways that certain countries at least try to tax oil, that try to, you know, uh, uh, incentivize like responsible development of grain fuels as opposed to oil and things like that, that we can learn from in this space beyond just kind of like the more in the weeds questions that we've been discussing. Thank you. I'm happy to answer the next question in the chat if we're at time. I think Harshit had a question, but the hand is unraised, so. Oh, uh, hey, yeah, I just posted the question. It was in the similar theme around benefits. Ah, sorry, I'm reading the question. Um, yeah, sorry. I think there are a couple of ways to try. Oh, Divi, go ahead. Sorry, uh, just in the interest of time, would you mind answering the question over chat, please? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And thanks for the great talk again. And folks, feel free to like keep asking your questions on the chat. That's a great way to engage. Um, thanks again, Divya. Uh, next up, we have Hari, uh, who's a faculty member at Stanford with appointments at the Graduate School of Education, Computer Science Institute for Human Centered AI and Stanford uh, Human Computer Interaction. Uh, Hari studies ways to augment human learning using AI and is uh, interested in prioritizing ethical considerations, uh, responsible design practices, and human values when creating AI experiences. Uh, and yeah, Hari and I are actively collaborating right now, so I'm excited for his talk. Uh, awesome. Uh, thanks for the intro, Devi. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to postulate that the way we currently build AI software is sort of optimized for resources and labor instead of really integrating responsible AI values, uh, especially from a global perspective. Oops. So in 2022, I took a ride sharing service from the Bangalore International Airport to my house. And just as we exited the airport, um, the, the driver had to stop and a, a notification popped up on his phone. He had to take a selfie to authenticate that he was, in fact, the person driving the car. Both him and I sort of um, were displeased that he had to do this. Um, and if you look at like Uber's sort of article regarding this, like, you know, the, the, the framing is sort of like selfie powered real time AI check comes to India. And a quick Google search on like this whole issue brought up like a number of articles and problems related to facial recognition service in India, which is sort of locking out drivers out of their accounts. Uh, and sort of the way to get fixed this is really challenging because they have to go like, you know, a number of level ups to like different managers, bribe different people to get their accounts unlocked so that they can actually earn some income. But if you look at the Uber's sort of like uh, documentation for how this actually works, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna pause here, but then like, this is not what the, you know, a person's uh, face and camera view with like a ring light would look like when you're driving uh, an Uber or Ola or whatever. So I think there is this sort of generalizability assumption that um, you know companies tend to make, especially when software is created in the US, like there is always this aspiration for generalizability. And unfortunately, there is not enough evaluation through participation from stakeholders in India or lack of a sort of uh, appropriate evaluation metrics. So which means like software that is developed obviously in the West is not going to work in, in uh, Bangalore, India. So in my work, we've been looking at how do we sort of uh, support co-design of AI powered applications at sort of different levels. And in my lab, we've built a bunch of tools, developed different design processes. 
So here is uh, what I'm showing you is sort of an overview of human-centered AI, like, you know, as uh, Divya also pointed out, like, you know, we need to be thinking about people, like, as we are sort of defining the training data needs, how we collect the data, how we are going to label the data, and thinking about things like privacy and security and data governance and so on. Similarly, when we are thinking about uh, the design or implementation of the AI itself, we, we need to sort of think about these uh, users, both in terms of the design itself, performance, evaluation, learnability, learnability, and so on, and as well as like, you know, at the user interface level, like in addition to sort of input output, we need to sort of take a human centered view when we are thinking about things like explainability, feedback, and failure. And all of this needs to align with this end user's task model. Like, how's this person going about like driving the car? And like, what is the sort of understanding of like the work? And what is he expecting like these applications to do for him? And how he should be interacting with this application in this case? Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, like a lot of software development happens through modular design and separation of concerns to sort of minimize dependencies, which means you'll have different teams working on different things. A lot of the core components, like, you know, building the AI models and collecting and training the data happens largely in the US. And, you know, maybe things like labeling the data, designing interface IO happens in, in India, which makes it really, really hard to actually align responsible AI values that we care about in India with like these um, global models and sort of foundation models and so on. So an open question for us to think about in today's um, workshop is like, how do we optimize these AI production workflows for our AI values instead of labor and resources uh, like we currently do? So in my group, I've done a number of studies looking at this problem from a designer and engineering perspective. And like one thing which we find, I'm not going to go into too much details, but we find that prioritizing data and having conversations around data and enabling tools that would allow diverse stakeholders like teachers and data scientists and uh, UX practitioners and legal experts to really think about like what are the implications for when you apply some statistical model to data to make certain decisions and enabling that uh, turns out is, is sort of one essential way to think about responsible AI uh, values in AI software development. So uh, a natural first question is like, you know, what should the AI do for humans? And again, uh, we noticed in a number of our studies that sort of starting with the data and constructing user scenarios around end user behavior for designing, uh, you know, these, um, the, the specific AI behavior is, is really helpful. And similarly, in thinking about like the implementation of this uh, behavior, like engaging in what we call cognitive walkthroughs with data and these AI models, uh, again, tend to be very helpful. And also in, in thinking about the user interface itself, like using a data-driven design approach for thinking about user interface, uh, make sure that like, you know, the, the sort of the experience is aligned across like the AI subcomponents, the user experience and human values. That is, uh, in, in all of these sort of collaborative participatory design, we find that end user data acts as this common ground for collaboration. Um, in my lab, we've been building a bunch of these tools that use this concept of data in thinking about like uh, tools for prototyping based on sort of model outputs and decisions, thinking about like different types of failures and how to design for different types of failures. And more recently, we are looking at how do we enable sort of teachers and public health experts to collaborate in, in the form of a data dialogue with data scientists and building these applications. Um, and with that, I'm going to take questions. I just wanted to sort of um, put forth this idea of using data as this common ground for having conversation and, and rethinking how we optimize uh, machine learning software workflows for responsible AI values and sort of just uh, resources. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so I still much. have two minutes. Okay. No, you're right on time. Uh, oh, two seconds. Cool. Okay. Super, super. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, any questions? Hari, there's a question on chat. Oh, okay. Uh, I see a hand raised. Why don't we answer that first and I can read the chat later. Sounds good. Smitha, do you want to ask your question? Thanks, Hari. Uh, that was really insightful. 
I had a question on uh, the difference in crowdsourcing data for specialized models. And then if you want to do it for a, creating a generative AI large language model. So we've been building um, NER and rhetorical role models for Indian legal text, particularly, uh, for which we had a lot of student volunteers and basically crowdsourcing a lot of legal expertise as well as uh, law mm -hmm. students uh, expertise. And then um, we we were able to achieve an average of about eighty five percent accuracy on those models. But now that we think about training a special, not actually a more general model uh, for as a basically a legal GPT, right? Uh, using mm -hmm. text. Um, just wondering what are the and and we're really struggling with that. We we've seen that the smallest model that we can build is with fifty six thousand parameters. Uh, but and of course, I mean, uh, ignoring the cost included with it, right? And yeah. and the cost is always in, uh, mostly associated. <laughs> acquiring that data. So any thoughts on how do we deal with this new sort of generative boom and uh, how do we go about acquiring or crowdsourcing data for creating a large language model for a smaller large language model, essentially specialized mm -hmm. to one particular area? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question, but it's also sort of like a very recent question. Uh, I am not sure I'm the best person to answer this, but um, what I will say is that I, I think sort of you know, with with these sort of general purpose large language models, a lot of it is also in sort of the fine tuning and prompt engineering process. So maybe thinking a little bit upfront about how that might work in terms of like the kinds of experiences you're envisioning could help you also think about like, uh, you know, how much of crowdsource data you want to collect and what type of crowdsource data you want to collect. Uh, we've been doing some of this work in in sort of the generative creative artists uh, context where we, we we we're building sort of products that would allow artists to engage in this um, exploratory programming approach. So and we did collect some amount of crowdsource data, but um, we, we were just using sort of GPT-4 out of the box and um, it, it tends to work OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's been our experience as well. But thanks so yeah, much. We'll, yeah, we'll we'll have we'll have uh, more to say on this maybe later in the year. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Hari, there's a question from uh, Pravindra, and how would this interact with concerns such as differential privacy, the focus on uh, end user data as a common mechanism? Yeah, I think we've been thinking about this in both in terms of like you, you'll need to have some kind of abstractions, but also we've been thinking about like data visualization interface and in data dialogue, we're, we're trying to see how whether we can sort of build a visual abstractions to mitigate some of the privacy concerns. But again, like in responsible AI, like, you know, this trade off between like fairness and privacy is sort of an ongoing area of research. Um, and I, yeah. Sounds good. Any other questions? We're all out of time, but maybe one last question if there's any. Awesome. Cool. Uh, if you have questions for Hari, feel free to put them on chat uh, and we'll have a discussion as well. All right. Next, we have uh, Divya Ved, and I promise I'm not just uh, calling people who have a name similar to me. Uh, Divya Ved is a faculty member at the Center for the Study of Social Systems at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, she specifically okay. studies social stratification, uh, social mobility, and inequalities, and her research method of preference is quantitative methods. Uh, take it over, Divya. Yeah, thanks. I had the same thought when I saw the list of people. So thank you for having me uh, for this discussion. I was asked to speak from my own perspective and the potential interaction with RAI as a novice. I'm a non-specialist in AI, probably an outlier in this group today. Uh, I'm a sociologist with an interest, as Divya said, in the study of social mobility and inequalities, broadly including class, gender, caste, and educational inequalities. Now, social mobility research um, often deals with both intragenerational, which is across a person's career, and intergeneration, which is across, um, you know, from parents to children, transfer of resources. Um, this research implies a focus on barriers and opportunities available to people in the labor market or through education to gain better position than their parents or than themselves earlier on in their careers. The focus is really on the reproduction of inequalities as tied to work. 
Um, in this context, technology can be an important factor that has the potential to influence uh, the kinds of jobs people get and the kinds of jobs people may be excluded from, hence increasing their opportunities, um, influencing, sorry, their opportunities of being um, socially mobile. For instance, uh, within the world of work, one could ask whether the ramifications of increased automation and AI-based tasks on the labor market. Uh, a new documentary on Netflix called Working, uh, led by Barack Obama, touches on the possibilities of restructuring in the labor market. For instance, they explore an example in which you have driverless cars which use this kind of technology and becomes more prevalent. Uh, this restructuring would lead to potential job losses, but also the potential to skill people in other tasks. Uh, these changes are not unique to AI. Occupations have always had the potential to be downgraded with the coming in of new technology. So for example, as the documentary also mentions, um, saddle makers lost their jobs when cars came along. So there will always be a change in terms of when technology comes in. Um, this clearly, of course, has ramifications for social mobility for those who may not have the skills to work with the new technology or have, who have been excluded uh, from the opportunity of such um, training. Now, this is significant in the Indian context where the informal sector and not the formal sector is one of, is the major employer. So there needs to be a discussion on the possibilities of training and harnessing the potential of AI in a range of occupations. In this question, uh, in this context, then um, I think there's an important question we should be asking, which is how does one imagine artificial intelligence? Part of the fear of AI may be the belief that jobs will be taken over by machines which can work autonomously. There appears to be a discomfort with AI as it is seen as a substitute for the human being, not just in action, but also in thought. But this fear isn't new. As you all know, there were movies in the 1980s, such as Terminator and Skynet, which had this fear about what, what um, something that acquires sentience might do. While this example is about um, a film, I think there needs to be more clarity in the public discourse about what AI is and the potential for that for a variety of jobs across industries and the kinds of resources and training that may be required to provide access uh, to this technology. Another example of the intersection of machine learning with the labor market and hence with inequalities and in social mobility is the use of AI programs to gauge and sift job applications matching CVs to the best jobs. Uh, there have been field experiment based research both in the US and in India uh, on name-based discrimination in the job hiring process tied to race, caste, or gender. If computers take on the task of matching people to jobs rather than HR managers, would this discrimination be restricted since individual subjective bias may be limited? Or would this discrimination in fact be amplified? What if the algorithm that does the matching was biased? Related to this, the potential intersections between technology and um, AI and job market inequalities are many. What if, uh, for instance, if technology assistant programs determine who the beneficiary of welfare benefits are, then a lot of responsibility lies on the design of these programs and the algorithms, and who is involved in the design of these programs and the regulations around the design. But that responsibility doesn't actually end there. It also extends to the monitoring of the program and the evaluation of continuous data from the field, for which AI may also be quite useful. Lastly, as an example, um, it would be remiss for me as an academic in a university not to mention the role of software programs <clears throat> such as GPT or chat GPT and the ramifications for those who not only teach, but also for those who study educational inequalities as I do. While COVID may have highlighted the sharp digital divide, not only across countries, but within them, this inequality in education was present prior to COVID as well, especially in the Indian context. If education plays a crucial role in getting a job, and if that job is influenced by the access to or exclusion from technology, then this has big ramifications on the inequalities that can persist in the labor market. On the other hand, equal access to technology and skills training has the potential to equalize existing inequalities um, in the labor market. Could one then harness the power of programs such as ChatGPT and the like in the teaching learning process, process in India? Beyond the concerns of academic integrity, there are other questions that come up and universities such as MIT, as you know, have begun conversations in this direction. Now, this is a conversation that's also needed in the Indian context, especially given the diversity of the classrooms that, uh, that, you know, that our universities have. 
And my last comment um, is that since I work with databases and statistical tools in my own work, trying to map patterns of inequalities and the factors that influence inequalities, I see a great potential, um, as Hari was also mentioning, for a conversation between a sociologist, policy practitioners, and those who work with AI when it comes to studying the persistence of inequality. So while I have less to say about the design of these programs, I think the ramifications of these programs are many. And sociologists um, being a part of this conversation can, I hope, only add uh, to what the conversation is. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, the weather was extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, we have a question from Sumit on the chat. And uh, Sumit, do you want to read out your question? Uh, that's all right. I think it's about a possibility of amplification of bias. How can we ensure the training data for AI is made free of inherent bias here? Yeah. So this is interesting because, I mean, there is work, of course, on algorithms and the kinds of biases that algorithms might have uh, when you look at policing, uh, the idea of the, the 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 idea of how you identify a criminal. I think you also have sessions in your own conference on on this. Um, so I guess it's more about. I mean, I, I wouldn't know about the the design of the programs, but maybe a conversation really about um, between people who do study inequalities. Um, and those who are designing these programs um, to see that what are the what are the possible ways in which we might we, we might it not, might not even be an overt bias, but there might be a bias. So I know, for instance, that studies that looked at um, uh, labor market have have looked at labor market hiring and looking at CV matching. I think there was some research on this that showed that if um, uh, because the the algorithm thought that the uh, the most the people who got the most jobs were male, that actually when women or something tied to gender came up, they tended to be lower graded uh, than if the, it was male. So it's really about understanding what potential for bias there is within these programs and then working, uh, you know, to, to try and work around those. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, if you had any thoughts on uh, how to quantitatively capture like this intergenerational, intragenerational uh, mobilities that have happened, right? And in some way, like, technology has an interesting role where if a job is gone, it erases all the upward mobility that has been built over the generation. So I'm curious, like, have you captured that uh, mobility in any way across sure. generations? And what kind of parameters do you use? Yeah, so I don't think if a job is gone, it re removes because what we uh, or removes, um, you know, the social mobility that's been done, uh, because essentially, um, it's about reproducing inequality over several generations. So um, the, the anxiety on social mobility is really amongst jobs which are slightly on the border, which where, you know, th they're more precarious. Um, so that, for instance, um, there's this uh, classic called the black coated worker, which looks at people who had clerical positions in the UK. Um, at, some, at one point, being a clerk was a really big thing because it involved education. But then education became mass based, which meant that anybody else, anybody could get education. And so those positions uh, themselves were downgraded. But it didn't mean that those people who already had education would be out, they would have to retrain for something else. So there is, I mean, larger models that look at inequality, try and look at them over a longer period of time to see, you know, where the, you know, where the stabilities are, where the precariousness is. Uh, but maybe that doesn't quite entirely answer your question, but it is possible to, to, to do that, but it's also there isn't a loss just because the job goes. Uh, I mean, so the the I, I would really recommend watching this documentary because it shows that certain jobs when they go, that's much more precarious. Uh, whereas other jobs, because you have education and you might have certain level of skills, you can retrain for for uh, you know other other possible positions. Super helpful. Uh, there's a question from Salim Al Sayed on the chat. Would you mind just answering that on chat so that we can? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll answer that on chat. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm just slowing the depth of these talks, uh, even though we're kind of going through them in a lightning fashion. Um, next up, we have Shachi. Uh, Shachi is a software engineer in the National Language Understanding Group at Google Research India. Her research uh, interests include natural language understanding, conversational AI and data mining, modeling, and their applications to various Google products. Uh, that's uh, billions of people like Search and Assistant. 
And recently, Shaji has been pioneering a very interesting research agenda around recontextualizing uh, NLP fairness. Uh, so I'm very excited for her talk. Shaji, take it over. Thank you so much, Livia, for the introduction. Um, is, uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, we can see them. All right. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of my work on fairness in NLP, uh, which was done with a team of researchers from Google Research, as well as some external collaborators. I'm specifically going to focus on the frameworks that we have developed as part of our research. Uh, and I have divided this talk into two parts. In the first part, I'll be presenting our agenda setting paper on recontextualization of NLP fairness in the Indian context. And in the second part, uh, I'll discuss a couple of strategies to build robust evaluation data sets for fairness evaluation in a scalable way. Uh, before I get into the details, I wanted to point out that because of the nature of this work, some of the content in this presentation can be offensive and triggering. Uh, with that, let's start with the first paper that was published at the ASL conference last year. So the motivation for this work uh, frame uh, stems from a paper that was published at the FACT conference a couple of years ago. It pointed out that a large majority of fairness research is framed in the Western context by researchers situated in the West and using data and ontologies from the West. And it argues for a need to recontextualize the ML fairness based on the geocultural aspects of each society. In our work, uh, we take this one step further and look at this problem from an NLP lens. Uh, we have made two main contributions in this paper. Uh, first, a holistic research agenda to recontextualize NLP fairness for the Indian context along three main pathways, uh, societal context, technological gaps, and value alignment. I'll cover this in more detail uh, in a moment. And second, uh, resources to enable, enable culturally situated stereotype evaluations in the Indian context. Uh, so coming back to the research agenda, like I said, we propose uh, looking to this problem using these three pillars. Uh, the first one uh, is accounting for the local societal context in evaluations. Uh, for instance, for India, that means taking into consideration access of disparities, uh, such as caste and regional identities. Other research questions are around data skew. For example, are different groups along various social axes sufficiently represented in data? Similarly, how do we formulate intersectionality in bias evaluation? For example, Dalit women who are marginalized on gender, caste, and potentially socioeconomic status. Uh, the second pillar is around the technological gaps. Uh, that is, how do we address the lack of tools and resources in NLP for Indian languages? Uh, this is particularly important considering that India is a multilingual country and we have to ensure that the technology is equitable for all these languages. And uh, finally, the third one is on value alignment. That is, how do we adapt these bias intervention, interventions to respect local cultural uh, values? I also want to point out that while we focus on India, uh, this framework is generalizable to other geocultural contexts as well. So like I said earlier, our second contribution in the previous paper over evaluation data sets, uh, but since they were built using a dictionary-based approach, they were quite limited in scope and coverage. Uh, so if we take a step back and start looking at the bigger picture, it's very obvious that we need a more scalable strategy to address these types of biases in other contexts. Uh, so we decided to leverage LLMs as a tool to extract societal uh, knowledge at scale. Uh, and this is how we, we did it. Uh, we started with a seed set of common stereotypes from existing research literature. Uh, then we used a few short approach to generate a larger uh, set of stereotype tuples and process them to create a sizable candidate set for evaluation. Uh, and these candidates are then annotated by humans on whether it's a prevalent social stereotype. So how well does this approach work? Uh, compared to existing stereotype data sets in NLP, the size and coverage have improved by 5x. For example, it now includes Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, which had negligible presence in previous data sets. Uh, some example stereotypes uh, from our data set are on the right. 
The LLMs are uh, great at candidate generation, but cannot guarantee 100% coverage. And this is because LLMs are trained on online resources. Uh, so there'll be blind to stereotypes that are not talked about online. Uh, so that's why uh, one of the strategies we have tried is to reach out to people from different parts of India and help them tell us the type of stereotypes that they have come across in their daily lives. Uh, this approach has helped us identify three broad categories of stereotypes that were missing in the uh, previous LLM-based approach. One, uh, what we call intersectional identity group, uh, which combines two or more identities, for example, Dalit woman. Two, uh, complementary stereotypes that are not commonly present online. And three, uh, given that the online content has a slight Western tail to it, it helps us remove the Western lens and provide a more nuanced understanding of the local context. For example, the LLM-based approach attributed vegetarianism to all Indians, whereas the community-based approach provided nuances at a state level. And that brings us to the end of this talk. Uh, we are actively working on scaling this effort across different cultures, languages, and communities. And if you want to contribute or have ideas on how we can do this better, feel free to reach out to me or any of my co-authors. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. That was an excellent talk and uh, such a concrete evidence for how to kind of like do this. Uh, there's a question on the chat. Uh, Ali, do you want to read it out? And Sure. Um, hi, thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, as a non-specialist in the field, I'm wondering how AI work in South Asia is developing. Is it making the same mistakes that the West is doing or is it actively being developed in a more fair fashion? So I have a two-pronged question. How does AI models coming out of India see, represent or parse non-Hindu Indians, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians, and or non-Indian South Asians, specifically Bangladeshis and Pakistanis? And second question, does Hindi Devana or Devanagari script dominate the field and subsume other Indian languages and scripts? Tamil, Shahmuki, whatever. Yeah, so excellent question. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so I'll answer the second one uh, first because uh, it's easier. Uh, so it is true that Hindi is one of the uh, major languages uh, among all the Indian languages. Uh, but uh, when we work on it, we, we uh, consider all uh, languages, at least the ones that are spoken by greater than um, 10 million people in India. So that's how we approach uh, the, the relative prioritization across languages. Uh, so the short answer is uh, no, we, I mean, Hindi as a language won't have uh, uh, you know, a different bias compared to other languages. And uh, what was the first question? Sorry, I lost it on the chat. Um, sure. So does um, AI being developed in, AI models developed in India, um, is it more fair toward non-Hindu Indian citizens or non-Indian South Asians like Pakistanis or Bangladeshis? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So I don't think it would uh, be so uh, because uh, when we try to develop more fairer models, we we make sure that all the major religions are, uh, you know, they have equitable distribution of the training data. Uh, so if uh, during development time, if that amount of care and thought has not gone into the entire process, uh, then maybe that's true. Uh, but if if the model is developed correctly in a, a more deep, deep biased way, then then I don't think uh, that that should ideally shouldn't be a problem. Great, thank you. Yeah, and there's like more evaluation methods kind of like in uh, Shachi's paper as well for how to debias it in case if uh, that's of interest. Uh, there's two more questions. Uh, Shachi, you can choose. And Avijit has his hand up. So uh, I can like also ask this later offline. Uh, other people, go ahead. Sounds good. Uh, Vasundra or Freyam, whoever wants to say out their question first. Hi, Sachi. 
so i was just wondering uh, what uh, kind of uh, like uh, like how did you frame caste bias in terms of language because uh, through language there are several of course slurs etc that goes on the language through which caste bias usually comes on but i'm curious like what was your team like when this process you, when you were starting to you know frame the question of bias itself in terms of just caste and uh, how like what was the annotation process after that and uh, like of course i can look at the models through your github profile but at the back end what is the kind of team that put up this question and how did you move forward with it uh yeah so we uh so for annotating the data sets we ensured the diversity of the annotators as much as we could um so that is uh, one uh, one part to it and um in terms of wh what it came up with uh, and how we went about it so we uh, we listed um, all the caste identities that are commonly present and are defined by the indian constitution so that formed our identity group and uh, then we uh, solicited uh, the various attributes that might be associated uh, with the caste using uh, various uh, strategies that i just described and uh, the last step is the human annotation process or the human validation process where the diverse uh, pool of data would annotate and uh, let us know whether uh, you know the stereotype is actually prevalent in the society uh, is this data uh, like openly available uh, so uh, it is so one data set is uh, openly available but i don't think it Includes caste. I think it is uh, region and caste, religion. There is very little data available. Yes, and uh, the second data set, which is coming soon uh, in a month or so, uh, that should have more identity types. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, Shachi, if you are able to answer the other questions over chat, that would be awesome. Thank you so much uh, for taking all these questions. And uh, glad to see we have the group fired up with very exciting, interesting questions. Uh, next, and uh, this is like our final uh, lightning talk, we have uh, Amin. Uh, Amin is a senior resident fellow at Vidhi and leads the Center for Applied Law and Technology Research, which is called ALTR. Uh, his interest and research focus uh, lie at the intersection of AI ethics and the governance of AI. Uh, Amin, take it over. Thanks, Devya. And uh, thanks to all the other organizers for having me here. I'm actually, in a way, I feel I'm glad that my conversation is coming after uh, Sachi's conversation because she had also indicated one of the aspects she mentioned was towards value alignment. And uh, given my own background as a primarily as a law and policy researcher, what I wanted to focus today was more around how uh, in India uh, currently, in terms of policy and governance, how we are looking at RAI as a concept, and uh, also particularly the role that the Indian constitution can play in sort of giving uh, guidance to this value alignment of uh, uh, value alignment to more universal principles of RAI uh, to give it a more indic flavor. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, I think I want to contextualize and begin by saying that uh, I think Divya mentioned that REI is not really a defined concept. I agree, but uh, I would say that at least in the Indian landscape, there has been some attempt in terms of policy research that has tried to integrate uh, more universal ideas into uh, AI ethics, AI governance, AI for social good, REI, like you can call it with different labels, but that conversation is not very stagnant or completely derivative of just what is outside of India and just trying to utilize here. Uh, Niti Aayog, which is the Indian government's think tank, has actually put out a couple of approach papers from 2021, uh, which literally sort of sets out seven key principles that they have identified as like key AI ethics principles that need to be uh, that need to be implemented when particularly when we are talking about AI's deployment in the public sector by the government, which is in, in again, like unique to India, I would say that probably like that is the more predominant use case that poses a larger 
concern or a larger amount of risk to the citizenry given how public facing it is and how it sort of tends to exploit on issues like automation bias, digital divide and things like that. So uh, that approach paper that Niti Ayo put out actually relied on this terminology called uh, this, this doctrine of constitutional morality, which fundamentally means that you are supposed to give a strict implementation to ideas that are enshrined in your constitution, the values of your constitution need to be paramount and need to trump political agendas, popular majority and popular aspirations. Now, in, in recent years where we have seen constitutional majority play an important role generally in, in law and in, in statutory interpretation, are issues like homosexuality where constitutional morality was referred to to decriminalize homosexuality in India in Navtej Johar. The right to privacy was read into the Indian constitutions overturning almost four decades of jurisprudence precisely because they sort of valued the idea that constitutional morality needs to be supreme. Constitution needs to imbibe an evolving society. And as of today, we need to have a preservation of our in informational autonomy. Even with respect to when we're talking about the use of AI systems, I think, again, like I feel that this point has come through different speakers. Uh, Shachi probably categorized it very categorically as a value alignment, but the idea is that it's not just about the design and development of the system, whether you're talking about making AI more democratic through governance, through participation of stakeholders, the idea that underlies there is to give it a more community, more regional flavor that sort of ensures that the community where it is going to be deployed is represented not just in the design and development of the system, but is not unfairly biased or discriminated against as a result of deployment of that system. So I want to briefly touch upon three areas where in my assessment, I feel like the fact that the Niti Aayog paper sort of theoretically gives that tether between RAI principles and constitutional morality. I think it's, a, it's an idea that needs to be pushed forward by the government, by researchers in this space, particularly non-technical researchers. Uh, and the reason for that is threefold. First, as I said, as I have sort of already mentioned multiple times, it brings a more index sort of flavor to the idea of universal principles of AI ethics. That at this point are, you know, ideas of, for instance, equality needs to be ensured and you cannot needlessly have a system that sort of discriminates or is biased against a certain group. Privacy is another concern that seems to be very prevalent when we're talking about AI systems, whether it is in terms of the design and development through the aggregation and collection and annotation of large data sets, or sometimes even using algorithms to process information, even anonymized information that can at times lead to breaches of personal information or e encryption or anonymization. So what would privacy entail in the Indian context needs to derive its understanding from how the constitution has been read to encrypt it. Uh, to give an example, uh, the EU's proposed AI Act is currently in its, in its compromise text that is going to be voted upon later this month has finally, after three and a half years, actually decided to ban real-time facial recognition surveillance. What they are going to permit as per the compromise text, and if this is adopted, then that would mean that real-time facial recognition or live facial recognition surveillance cannot be permissible in any part of the EU. This is quite a measure. Uh, I don't want to go into the debate about whether it's good or bad, but simply, if I was to take this understanding with respect to biometric surveillance in the Indian context and examine how India would probably say if tomorrow we come up with a legislation similar to the AI Act, how would we address the issue of facial recognition technology? I think we will have to examine it from our own perspectives. Now, we have a judgment from the Supreme Court which laid down a three-pronged test of you having a legislation or a lawful backing to undertake some kind of action by the state which violates your right to privacy. So say if tomorrow the government actually enacts a legislation that allows for facial recognition uh, 
facial recognition technology to be used by the police in certain circumstances, that prong gets checked. The second prong is it needs to satisfy a legitimate state interest. Now, arguably, and this is something that even the judgment of Puttuswami, where your right to privacy has been upheld, recognizes that there is a legitimate state interest in preserving law and order, but it needs to be tempered by an idea of proportionally responding to any law and order threat. Now, what would proportionality look like is, again, a case by case determination. It's not a fixed rule, thumb rule. So, for instance, in very exceptional circumstances, facial recognition, given our current constitutional morality or our current constitutional disposition towards the right to privacy, it could be argued that it is something that can be legitimately used by the state, even law enforcement in a very contentious use case. Now, a second instance of where tethering your RAI principles to constitutional morality helps is basically, again, uh, it allows to bring in, like, like I said, the idea behind constitutional morality is to uh, ensure the paramount nature of constitutional values, uh, ideas of human-centric, rights-oriented, uh, democratic values, which, again, are not unique to India. These are discussions that are prevalent even globally when we talk about the risks or the challenges of AI system. And it is something that in India can be safeguarded to a great extent if we examine the idea of responsible AI through the constitutional lens. Uh, just to again go back to an example, something that may be popular or may intuitively make sense or may commonsensically look like, okay, this seems like a good solution may not actually be sufficient to pass constitutional muster. To give an example, we are increasingly seeing the effect of foundational models, generative AI, particularly large language models across industries. One industry where there is some, so some amount of common usage that is growing across the globe and even in India is the legal or the judicial sector. Uh, we recently had a case in the US where a lawyer used chat GPT in, a, in, in an actual court case to cite certain cases and then it was later discovered that none of those cases actually exist. It was a problem. It was not just a problem because it is like a, like a factual representation of something that is not there. It has real implications if the judge had actually relied on something like this and passed a, passed a decision it can have real implications on the outcome of the case. Similarly, in India, we've actually had an instance just a couple of months back where a judge from the Punjab and Haryana High Court has gone publicly on record that he used chat GPT to research what the legal position is on the grant of bail in a case of extreme violence where the accused is, uh, where the accused is charged with an extreme or aggravated assault. Now, again, this is some chat GPT, as I feel most people in this conversation here would probably recognize, is not a factually accurate tool. They tend to categorize it, thanks to Google, as hallucinations. But the outright point is that it is it, it very much has a propensity at times to give completely inaccurate or fabricated answers. Relying on something like this in the judiciary to say, transcribe a document or to help a judge with case research may commonsensically due to automation bias, due to lack of an actual understanding of how chat GPT works or how large language models work in terms of accuracy and reliability is something it may seem commonsensical and a judge may feel or a judiciary may feel inclined to do it. But the constitution will not allow you to do that because it will have concerns around uh, Around due process, this is something that has significant implications on fairness and equity and due process that that courts need to adhere to. So again, like I feel that if you read your RAI principles, which have at this point been listed out by Niti Aayog, and try to examine them through the constitutional morality lens, you have a good sort of benchmark to draft your legislation or potential governance frameworks on how to regulate the use of AI, especially within the public sector. And uh, those were broadly my two points. I'm happy to take questions on this. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Amin. 
questions thoughts um, um hi i mean um, i'm monisha i my question might be a little premature but uh, what do you think about uh, when it comes to regulating ai if uh, india has to come up with a law um, if uh, say it is in line with the proposed eu ai act then do you think like um, how is it going to ban out in india is it going to stifle innovation is it a are we as a country ready to adopt a legislation for ai uh thanks manisha i i like at least from my current understanding which comes mostly from whatever the minister says in the public domain and whatever the consultations around the digital india act have been i think we are going to be significantly varying from what the eu's ai act does because uh what we will probably mimic to some extent is having like some categorization around potential risks that certain kinds of ai systems pose uh i think that is something that we definitely can do uh i my my own hope at least like like things that i have sort of proposed for both in writing and in other forms of advocacy has been that uh i think at this point like the, the niti aayog's principles are actually quite comprehensive even in terms of uh global benchmarking of what ai ethics needs to look like i really hope that the digital india act to some extent codifies those principles and even if they are going towards a risk assessment framework i think it again fundamentally needs to stem from those seven principles of equality reliability preservation of privacy safeguarding human values and human rights upholding constitutional morality and uh, yes i feel like again i i think that this kind of a legislation would definitely be needed uh my sense is that the government has again like constantly in the last i would say 12 to 18 months said that they want to not go very ha heavy handedly in terms of regulation so i i don't think it's going to in that sense like it it will be significantly different from the proposed ai act because i think what they are looking at is much more oriented towards setting out some key principles or codifying certain code categories of risks that ai systems may pose and then allowing for more uh, industry and regulatory self like regulatory level of uh, governance the, which flows outside of the government or the legislation but through rules and probably codes of practice okay thank you so much also like i wanted to understand since like the the proposed eu ai act of um, is basically very prescriptive when it comes to transparency obligations and um, uh, like um, everything human oversight the, the principle of human oversight it, like uh, the companies the industry has to take like significant i think steps uh, i i want to understand like how monetarily like it's going to affect companies or small uh, like you know if we are to come out uh, come up with an act which is prescriptive in terms of what it expects from the industry so are we ready uh, is the ready industry uh, like uh, industry ready for it or is it going to uh, stifle innovation in any way i mean i think that's a that question would vary from depending on who you ask if you ask the industry i'm pretty sure it could be a resounding sort of don't over regulate don't uh, pass hard coded legislation but i think ultimately uh if it's if it's purely a question of cost because this seems to be the same case when they're talking about even data protection there there are concerns around like okay what are the costs in terms of especially for say startups or younger companies that do not have the resources of a big tech corporation uh there are always incentives that you can afford in terms of tax breaks etc subsidies that the government can do and i think like given the government's approach to sort of uh, tap into the ai industry and the ai sector i feel that those kind of incentives will definitely counter the cost implications of regulation but again i feel that like uh we are my my sense at least if anybody asks me to predict at this point is that we are not we are going, we're going to be considerably at variance from what the eu's ai act is looking like right now okay thank you thank you thanks a lot i mean and uh, manisha asmita would you mind taking up your question over chat uh, because we have like only 15 minutes left and we are hoping to do like a quick activity uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, i've been taking some notes and i'm happy to summarize them and put them up on twitter or for this group as well uh, avijit take it away for the activity please